Good afternoon. On behalf of the Historical Society of Harford County, welcome to this afternoon's presentation, Old Joppa Town on the Eve of the American Revolution. I'm Jackie Seneschal, your host for this brown bag lunch. Our guest today is Dr. James Gibb, Director of the Smithsonian Environmental Archaeological Laboratory at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. He and Dr. Adam Freckia are leading a team of archaeologists who've been conducting summertime digs in Joppa Town on the grounds of the Church of the Resurrection. The congregation at that church dates back to colonial times, the colonial times of the Port of Joppa, which was a precursor to the Port of Baltimore. With us today, in addition to Dr. Gibb, is the actual copy of the Bush Declaration, which is one of Harford County's contributions to the Amer history of the American Revolution. Jim Gibbs has been a field archaeologist for 45 years. He earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees through the State University of, of New York and has published widely on topics ranging from 10,000-year-old Paleo-Indian sites to early colonial plant plantations and from the dietary practices of the 20th century urban garbage disposal in surrounding rural areas. But with all of that, we want you to talk about Joppa Town and Old Joppa. Jim, tell us about the archaeological digs and what you've learned so far. Okay, well, that is the subject of today, isn't it? So shall we go directly to slides? First of all, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk with you folks. Uh, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes on uh, the archaeology that we've started at uh, Joppa Town. And this is work conducted uh, largely by Dr. Adam Frackia, uh, who is at the University of Maryland and also a Smithsonian research associate like myself. I have a few text slides here, uh, mostly there for my benefit, not for yours. Uh, just to remind me of things. Uh, most of what you'll see are graphics. Uh, first of all, Joppa uh, was designated as a town site in 1706. Towns didn't necessarily just emerge naturally. They were uh, legislated by the General Assembly. Uh, the courthouse was completed in 1712. And then the court moved to Baltimore City in 1768. So Joppa was no longer the county seat. Uh, Joppa became part of Harford County in uh, 1774. And we're not quite sure when, but it eventually uh, transformed from a courthouse, a county seat, a, a small village into basically just farmland. And so that's one of the things we'll be talking about this afternoon. Of course, this thing decided not to work now. Huh? Excuse us for a moment as we deal with a little technical issue. Oh, there we go, advancing the slides. Again, read this or not, it doesn't matter. It's mostly for my benefit. So why are towns important? And particularly why are towns important in the years leading up to the American Revolution? Well, towns were important, first of all, because that's where the courts would be. That's the center of law. It's also where the prisons would be for those who don't obey the law. It's the center of politics. Uh, people would get together, principally men, uh, principally European American uh, men, would congregate at taverns and talk politics. Uh, so uh, pretty dramatic. And they would talk about things like non-importation. How can we get Britain to do what we wanted them to do by refusing to import their goods? If they're the center of commerce, that's where the warehouses were. That's where the ships would come in from Europe to unload goods from Europe. And it's where uh, people would come to purchase those goods. Also where they would bring tobacco or whatever crops they were raising for uh, transportation back to the old world. And it's also a place of capital formation. By that, I mean, this is where the money was. This is where people could accumulate large amounts of money, which they can then loan to planters. So they get through the next season. So the town sites are really important. Now, uh, Jop was founded as a result of one of the later town acts. This is a series of legislative acts by the General Assembly, approved by Lord Baltimore, establishing town sites throughout the Chesapeake. Uh, as many, uh, there are usually 60 to 100 acres in extent. 
uh, although Joppa was an exception, it was only 20 acres, divided to uh, lots, uh, residential lots, reserving two larger ones for the, the church, Church of England, uh, and the courthouse, and also for a jail or prison. Uh, individuals could patent those lots. That is, we could say, look, I want this lot or this group of lots, and I will pay a, a semi-annual rent of so much to hold on to those lots. In order to hold on to it, though, you had to build a dwelling on it, something with a fireplace, at least 20 feet by 20 feet or 400 square feet uh, within three years. And if you didn't, then you lost your rights to that lot. Uh, the rents were nominal. You know, uh, the important thing was they wanted to get these, town lot, these towns populated. And as part of the agreement, not only did you have to pay a rent every you know, twice a year, but you also had to swear an oath of fealty in which you, you uh, express your fealty to Lord Baltimore and acknowledge that he had the rights to the land. It's really important for folks to remember that in colonial Maryland, up until probably the 1750s, there was only one landowner in Maryland. That was Lord Baltimore. Everybody else was a tenant, you had to pay rent and take that oath of fealty. Here's a you know, uh, relatively early map of Maryland, a very, relatively uh, early detailed map dating to 1797. And we're going to focus on where that red rectangle is, which encompasses what is now Joppa. But you can see in that, uh, in that map, you can see this roads crisscrossing the place. There are towns that have developed. So here's a sort of a detailed view of that. You can see Joppa underlined in red near the center of the map. And there's a little symbol just to the left of the word Joppa that shows that this is a town site. And just north of it, there's some, uh, just above it, there are some symbols that indicate mill sites. This was, uh, milling was really important, particularly flour milling, because a major product of this area by the late 18th century was wheat, which would be turned into flour, which could then be shipped abroad to the Caribbean and even back to the old world. So we've got a town here in 1797. Well. If you recall what I said a few moments ago, that the, the uh, courthouse was moved from Joppa to Baltimore in 1768. That didn't mean the place disappeared as a town. Here we have it showing up on a 1797 map. So it's still there, it still has some reality. In 1858, a half century or more later, Joppa just shows up as a crossroads. It's even spelled differently on this map. It's spelled Joppet uh, Roads. But you can see in the red rectangles uh, on the map that there are still mills present. So it's still important for milling, but it's really just a crossroads hamlet at this point. It's no longer really a town. And in fact, most of the area below where it says Joppa Roads is, is called Joppa Farm. So it's pretty much gone by 1858. In 1878, we have a map showing the area where it's all farms. I didn't even draw any red, red rectangles because there's nothing any that we can identify as Joppa Town at that point in time. We do have a plat uh, of the town uh, dating to 1725. This is actually a reproduction of it. I'm not quite sure if we have the original or not, but it shows a small town, again, only 20 acres, whereas most of these town sites are 60 to 100 divided up into a bunch of lots that people could patent and use as residences or businesses. Well, frankly, in the 18th century, there was really no division between the two. It's unlike today. If you had a house in town, you were also operating some sort of business out of it, usually. Carpenter, blacksmith, a merchant, or when the tobacco fleet, or, you know, when the fleets would come in, you'd, serve, you'd be an ordinary, you'd, you'd house people. But you see two rectangles on in the left-hand side, that's for the church, and the one in blue is for the courthouse and prison. And uh, on those slides to the right, you can see those two rectangles represent places where Adam and I have been working for the past, uh, well, since uh, last year, doing some initial exploratory archeology span to see what can we find, what survives of this town site. Because we wanna get some sense of what it was like to live in Joppa in the 18th century. And it's very difficult if we don't know how many buildings were there, where were the streets? What were those buildings used for? When were they built? When were they demolished? 
Uh, Jop is one of a series of port towns, again, founded through these town acts. And these towns the sites were usually far up river. So they'd be close to the hinterland where people produced goods for, uh, for export, but still have water access so they can get the stuff out to transatlantic ships. And in 1945, a geographer looked at these town sites, a number of them, including Joppa, and he was really interested what happened to these towns. And he found that all of them, uh, the waterways had filled with sediment, uh, material that had eroded from the land, mostly because of poor farming practices. So a lot of these town sites before the revolution actually were no longer town sites because the waterways they relied on had filled with sediment. This is a model that uh, Louis uh, L.C. Gottschalk provided us with, and I've modified a little bit so it's a little easier to read. But you can see the top one, which he dates 1800. This is actually for Port Tobacco in Charles County. Um, but he created a model for Port Tobacco, and you can see it's got these uplands that are eroding, and it's got the stream, Port Tobacco Creek. And you can see uh, towards the upper part of that stream, you can see it says Port Tobacco, and it's a little symbol for a town. That's 1800. 1862, he had another map that he could use. And you could see that Port Tobacco hasn't moved, but the stream has greatly reduced. And there's no longer, it's no longer a navigable waterway. Uh, now, first of all, from our research there, we know he was wrong. This happened long before 1800. Uh, and this was happening in the 1750s and was pretty well, uh, that area pretty much filled with sediment by the 1770s. It was no longer navigable. Uh, but that model uh, applies to most of the towns in this area, including Joppa Town. So here we have some aerial photographs of Joppa. Uh, this one from 1945, again from L.C. Gottschalk. And you can see the shoreline has actually changed. He marks it out 1700, the solid white line, and then 1846 with the dotted line and then 1897 with the dashed line, what we see is basically new land being created. And it's being created because all these sediments from the fields and roads and residences in the area is washing down into the gunpowder and being redeposited. So we're creating new land accidentally, but we're also destroying the waterway that was the lifeline for the town, which shows up just in the upper uh, right-hand quadrant of the image. Here's a quote, you don't have to read it, I'm gonna read it for you. It's really interesting. This comes out of Gottschalk's paper. Today, the above tide deposits extend nearly to the Pennsylvania Road uh, Railroad Bridge, a mile and a half below the town site. The scene at Joppa Town is one of desolation. Old foundations are still visible through the tangled growth of weeds and underbrush. At a distance of 20 or 30 feet out from the original shoreline is a heap of stones. The remnants of the old wharf, a hundred feet beyond, is tree-covered land where ships once rode at anchor. I think this is fascinating stuff. 1945, he could still see the remains of the town on the surface, which is no longer true. And the, 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 the town is almost landlocked. From being a thriving port 200 years later, it's a landlocked, desolate place. Images on the left are what a little bit of what Joppa Town looks like today. And it really covers a good part of it because remember, it's only 20 acres and where Joppa is located, which now is in the middle of a residential subdivision, has been since the 1960s. This is what Joppa looked like, it's sort of core of the town in the 1930s. And I think you're looking towards it. There's a tenant farmer house there and you're looking towards the church that is still there. Well, the church that's there now is a rebuild. But you can see there's livestock grazing in town. It has become agricultural. But in the 1960s, Joppa Town, a residential subdivision, was created. And a large part of that area was basically bulldozed and houses constructed. Uh, with the exception, you can see in the lower right hand corner, uh, where the core of the town was, a lot of that had been preserved because it was owned by the church, still owns you know, six, eight acres. 
And the mansion site, the Muncie Mansion, just uh, uh, below it, which is, I don't know, 11 acres or something like that. And so between the church and the Chess family, which owns the mansion site, we have a good part of that original 20 acres that survived. Unfortunately, portions outside that area have either been developed with uh, houses or were used for gravel mining, sand and gravel mining during the construction of the 1960s. So we have lost a lot. And it's unfortunate. It's the sort of thing that hopefully would not happen today, but there were no protections in the 1960s. Uh, just a view of the town from the air, showing the various lots around it. And you can see towards the right-hand side is the church, towards the left-hand side uh, is the, uh, uh, the mansion site, this courtesy of Stevens Environmental that uh, did the aerial photography and topography for us. Uh, We've been working on this with just field schools, that is college students um, taught by uh, Dr. Adam Frackia. And they've gone out for three to six weeks uh, last year and this year, pretty much in August, conducting archeological surveys to find out what survives below the ground, be below these nicely manicured lawns. They're not the first ones on the site. There was a uh, um, volunteer effort, uh, avocational archeologists were there uh, during the major residential construction, trying to salvage a little bit. Uh, they made the newspapers, they collected a bunch of artifacts, which are still on exhibit at the church. Uh, but we don't really have a good sense of what they found and where they found it. And that is unfortunate. This was not really scientific archeology. span It wasn't geared towards answering specific questions. Uh, an example of what they were, principal thing of what they did was they worked around the 1725 church foundation which is a few feet from the current church. And you can see their excavation obviously done with machinery on the left. And on the right is what it looks like today, uh, staked out with some wooden posts. Uh, so some sort of cemetery uh, uh, ceremony, uh, establishing a baptismal font there at the church. Uh, judging from the clothes they're wearing, the houses in the background, I'd say it's probably late 60s 19, or 1970s. One of the things we did at um, Joppa was that we had the Maryland Historical Trust or State's Preservation Agency come out and use ground penetrating radar to see what they could find below the ground. And this is its radar. You pull it along the ground at uh, very tight intervals and it emits energy through the surface and then measures the speed and strength of the reflections giving us a radar image of what is below the ground. So this image, it looks like a black and white photograph, but it really isn't. It's a computer simulation of what they could find below ground. And we've got it marked out. In the upper left hand is the 1720s church foundation. That showed up very nicely. Uh, modern utility line. I don't know if that's water or electric. Uh, the 1960s gravel road that the developers used to get to the water where they were gravel, uh, mining sand and gravel. Uh, the tenant farmhouse that was there, certainly in the 1930s. Uh, and part of the historic road that ran through there, but not much else. The radar was not very successful in finding things that we already knew were there from previous excavations. Uh, and that has to do with the folks using the machinery. They're, they're kind of learning how to do this. And uh, they've done it twice. I think when they next time they come back, we'll get better results. It's like anything else. With practice comes perfection. To give you an idea of what we might find though, I'm gonna go back to Port Tobacco in Charles County for a moment. This is a, a similar image uh, work done by a fellow named Tim Horsley, who's a magician with this stuff, showing what his radar picked up there and then his interpretations of it. So the left-hand screen shows what he would call anomalies. And the right-hand screen shows his interpretation of those anomalies. So you can see in black, all kinds of buildings and walls, uh, stuff we knew was there, but didn't know where. He's effectively giving us a map of the town without, ha without having to do any digging. Now, we still need to excavate to figure out what those buildings were used for when they were occupied. For instance, uh, uh, Esther Doyle Reed, who's uh, the county archaeologist down there, and has kind of taken over from me at Port Tobacco. These are her excavations, and you could see that L-shaped feature. That's a brick foundation. And it's part of what uh, I think we uh, was a brewery. I think Esther thinks it was a brewery and maybe a print shop too. I don't recall the details. 
So getting back to Champa, you can see dashed in red is the area that the field school has looked at over the last two seasons. In the first season, yeah, you know, these are small excavation units, uh, about a meter to uh, two meters uh, on a side, which is you know three to six feet. And both of these, they found brick rubble that suggests the demolition of buildings. Now, everything above it has been pretty much destroyed when the developers came through and did some uh, grading. But below what they graded, we're finding what we call archaeological features with debris from the past. And those features produced 18th century artifacts. They also found this uh, refuse-filled pit. And that's what uh, Nikki on the right has got in her hands, some of these 18th century artifacts. So this is stuff that predates the American Revolution. But the demolition that resulted in these features is much later. So uh, this past August, the crew went through and dug shovel test pits, not on the church property, but on the Chess family property, the Muncie uh, ma uh, mansion property. And every 21 feet, every seven meters, they dug one of these shovel test pits, screened the soil, collected those artifacts, recorded the soils, backfilled and moved on. And from those distributions, we get some sense of where material is. So in this case, on the left-hand side, they found part of the gravel road that ran through there. Um, the gravel was pretty tough for those kids to dig through. And you can see it on the right in an excavation, unit, all that rubble in the upper part of the soil. That's part of a gravel road that was constructed in the 1960s. But beneath that gravel, Beneath the disturbances of the 20th century, you could see Connor here on the left, he's got the upper part of a 18th century wine bottle. Um, and he, the crew found that, and you can see in the, the image on the right, below these stratified deposits of soil, fairly deep down in a deposit of 18th century refuse. That refuse is what's gonna tell us about the past. Uh, just some other examples of materials they have. I think on the left, it's a part of a spoon. I can't see what's on the right, but. And what we're finding is material that was deposited 200, 250 years ago. And it's only one small spot of this 20 acre site, but it's giving us a, a sense of not only what happened in the 18th century and what the town look like. But it's also telling us what happened afterwards. And it's pretty clear from the deposits we were looking at that a lot of the buildings at Joppa at some point were actually raised, they were demolished. And in most cases, it looks like the bricks, the good usable, reusable brick were, were salvaged, taken away from the site. So virtually all the brick we're looking at is broken. And you can see, um, the uh, yellowish material to the left, that's subsoil, that never before disturbed by humans. And there's rubble, there's gravel above that. But as you move towards the right, you can see there's these darker soils. And around the middle of the screen, you could see sort of a rectangular feature. So you get a better view of that, yeah. So what the field crew found was a brick foundation. And if you look at the right-hand image, look down that dark area, that's a brick floor. So we're essentially in a building, an 18th, uh, mid, early to mid 18th century building that was used for what purposes? We don't know, because it's just one keyhole look at the structure. But it was certainly there in the 18th century and then at some point demolished and rubble filled the cellar hole. The uh, students, some of the students who worked on the dig this August are actually in the lab now with Adam uh, washing this material, they're going to begin cataloging it, and then we begin the analysis. Uh, it isn't just a matter of going out and finding artifacts. You know, we need to be able to identify, catalog, analyze distributions, figure out what things date to, uh, what functions, what activities they represent. So it's 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 a complicated process, and it takes a little while. So at this point, this is a preliminary look at what we're finding. And well, here's a couple of the field school students now washing away in the University of Maryland lab. And all those boxes there, they're not from the site. They're from other sites that the university's excavated over the years. But I think if we keep at this long enough, not just with students, but with 
folks like you volunteering, uh, we could do a tremendous amount of question-driven research at JAPA, and we will be accumulating a lot of artifacts. Some examples of what they found, these are some uh, stonewares and ceramics uh, dating to the 18th century, recovered from uh, this past August. Uh, some other earthenwares and stonewares recovered. Uh, virtually all of this stuff is uh, British origin, uh, either English or Scottish. So what are we gonna do next? Well, we'd like to go back and do some more geophysical testing that is using ground penetrating radar. Hopefully get a little better at it, and get a better sense of what's below the ground, much like we have done at least one small part of Port Tobacco. Doing that will help us identify where buildings were, where roads were. And then when we go back and do additional excavation, we can target those excavations on those areas that the ground penetrating radar tells us have the most will be most successful in recovering good information. So those excavations could help us determine what those buildings were used for and when they were used, but how the functions may have changed over the years and when they were demolished. And as a result, we'll get a better sense of what Joppa looked like, much like we'll do at Port Tobacco and London Town and Colchester in Virginia, the number of these colonial town sites. We'll begin to get a better sense of what they look like so we'll have essentially think of it as a stage, a theatrical stage. And the buildings and the roads represent are the set design and the props, the stuff we dig up, you know, mugs, beer mugs and whatnot. And that gives us a sense of the environment these people are interacting in as they were beginning to get really ticked off at King George III and beginning to talk about what steps were necessary first to assert ourselves and eventually to declare independence. So anyway, I uh, just wanted to, uh, Adam and I have a whole bunch of folks we'd like to thank. I won't read you all of this, but uh, pro private property owners, uh, institutions, individuals, uh, these uh, archeology span is a team sport. And I'm happy to answer any questions uh, when we're ready to turn today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that update on what you're doing in Joppa Town. Um, I expect that some of the folks who live in Joppa Town have seen your folks out there in the summertime and wondered what's going on. So this is a good way for them to get an idea of what's happening. Um, I do want to remind our viewers that we you have the ability to um, share with us your questions using uh, the Q&A or comment function. And I see we have a question that says, what is your archival research? Is your archival research ongoing, or do you feel that you have that you have what you have, what you have is appeared to be? I can't read it all. But I guess talk a little bit about a little bit more about what's going on and how you're doing that. Uh, we need to do a lot of archival research. Uh, to tell you the truth, this whole thing started last year because Adam was going to be running a field school. I mean. I've been talking to folks down at Joppa Town for a year or so before this happened about the prospect of doing archaeology, and we didn't have any resources available at the moment. Uh, Adam was going to uh, run his field school at a site in Baltimore County where they'd been for a year or two before then, but because of the plague, the county wouldn't let him get in there. So we had Joppa was basically a backup. Sorry, guys, not the personal, but you weren't first on the list. I consider it an advantage, something something good that's come out yes. of play. Yeah, I mean, it was it was my top of my list, but it wasn't top of Adam's, but now it is. Uh, so we kind of hit the ground running, and there's a lot of archival research that really should be done that has not yet been done, and that's something people can help us with. Uh, we have all of these lots in town. We can teach people how to do title research and sort of figure out who owned each lot in town over the years. Uh, we need to look at whatever records are available at the Maryland State Archives. Uh, once with the title research, once we find out who owned what lot, th then we have names. And with those names, we can start doing mini biographies of each of these people, learning as much as we can about them, including what role they may have had in the years leading up to the American Revolution and you know, developing what became the state of Maryland. 
Uh, so there's a lot of archival research that can be done, has not been done. And some of that research can be done here at the Historical Society. Uh, we have court records that go back as far as court records go in Harford County, um, and they do go back into the 1700s. Uh, we have the book that holds the Bush Declaration is actually the journal of the Harford County Revolution Commission Committee. And so once we know those names from Joppa, we can begin to say which of the folks who are listed here were from Joppa. Or, right? or is there information? We have names here. We do. We have those names. Where did these people live? And I bet you some of them lived uh, in or adjacent to Joppa. And so, you know, we already have you know, kind of a leg up here, but uh, title search is the best way to go because it gives us a sense of who owned what lot and the lots were all numbered. And hopefully in the land records are also numbered. So if somebody purchased, you know, uh, patents lot 36, we can find out, okay, they, that means this spot here. Who did they get it from? If they didn't get it directly from Lord Baltimore. Uh, and who did they convey that lot to? So, I mean, the possibilities here are incredible. They are. And again, another research a resource that we have is that there was a tax inventory done in 1814. Mm -hmm. um, of all the properties in Harford County. We've used it for the building that we own at the Hayes House <clears throat> to provide information about its background. But mm -hmm. depending upon how many of the ownerships still existed in the early 19th century, that might be another source that someone could use to find information. Those, those, those tax records, those assessment records actually uh, can give us a better sense of when the town met its demise, when it basically just became a farm. Okay. My great, great, great grandfather, John Stokes, a founder, owned a lot there, and I would like to get any snippets of information as to which lot he owned. Also, where and when do I sign up to volunteer for the next phase? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, uh, that's, you know, the, the slide I showed about for our next steps uh, left off really the first and most critical step, which is getting organized. Uh, this is, you know, we're looking at anniversary year for the county. And we're looking at what I think is a great opportunity here. In five years, we're going to be celebrating the semi-quincentennial, learn how to spell that and how to pronounce it, the semi-quincentennial, the 250th anniversary of our country. More, more urgently, in 2023 and 2024, we will be celebrating the 250th anniversary of Harford County. And plans are already afoot. Uh, for making that celebration mm -hmm. a reality. Uh, the steering committee, in fact, meets the day after tomorrow to consider a whole host of ideas that have been generated for mm -hmm. how to celebrate our 250th, I'm not even going to try to say that big word, <laughs> our 250th anniversary, which then um, is, as you said, a really good lead into the 250th anniversary mm -hmm. of the United States. We have some more questions. Are you aware of the pewter communion service plate and chalice given to Joppa Church by Queen Anne and kept at St. John's in Kingsville? I've heard about it. I haven't actually seen it, but uh, yeah, we've been told about it. <clears throat> Was the port of Joppa still accessible in, by the 1770s or had all the shipping moved to Baltimore Harbor by then? Um, <clears throat> good question. It's one of the questions we would need to, uh, to discover. Uh, it's important to realize with shipping is that transatlantic ships, by and large, anchored out in the bay. Most of them did not actually come up to town sites. They would have smaller vessels, shallops, that would run out to the various private landings and public landings in places like Joppa, where they would unload and load and then take that stuff back to the ships waiting at anchor. And that allowed a ship to basically bring in products from all around a particular area quickly so they can load up and get back to the old world because they're paying for crews. And also whoever got back to port soonest got the best prices on whatever merchandise they were selling. So um, yeah, well, one of the things we really need to figure out is when did that uh, the waterway become so filled with sediment that it was really no longer commercially usable? Well, the county's uh, new historic preservation planner has a background in marine archaeology. And I know we've already had discussions with her about um, some of the remnants of the old wharfs right. that are there and visible in aerial photos. Yeah, so those wharfs, not only the wharfs and piers, but derelict vessels, all that stuff 
likely remains preserved under many feet of sediment, uh, either in the water or what is now land. And those things could certainly be discovered and found, and that would be a fabulous undertaking, especially those that are now on where it's now dry land. Doing archaeology in the water poses all sorts of challenges, uh, beginning with getting permits to do it, whereas on land, you know, we're a lot more flexible. Right. Um, are, is, are there any public exhibits on the Joppa Town Day? There's something at the Cecil County Library. I, I'm not, I don't live in this area. I live down in, uh, near Annapolis. Uh, in the church, uh, Church of the Resurrection, they do have some uh, glass cases with finds from the 1960s. And I think uh, the Archaeological Society of the Northern Chesapeake, uh, Dan Coates, uh, has uh, some displays somewhere. I don't. He, his displays are in the Cecil County Public Library in Perryville Perry. at the moment, I believe. Um, but perhaps if there's enough interest in, from the, the Joppatown Library, um, we could put that exhibit in their library as well. Mm -hmm. I would, one of the things growing out of this, I think uh, should be uh, an important exhibit, maybe here at the Historical Society, uh, in time for the anniversary of the county, the 250th. Well, I think the thing to understand about the Historical Society, and, and you know that right now our building is not open to the public because we are in the midst of a renovation and restoration mm -hmm of the library area, mm. which will become a museum of Harford County history. Yeah. So yes, it will be available by the 250th celebration. That's one of our goals. Mm. Um, and it will include a number of displays on Harford County history. And I'm sure that some of the material that come from that comes from Joppa Town will be part of that. Uh, and certainly Adam and I will do our best to make sure that the county has what it needs to do the best possible job in interpreting Joppa. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the 1877 map, um, do you remember which one that is? There's the 1878. That's or 18, the, seven, oh, it's 1878. Right? I think yeah. that's the, uh, I don't remember who the guys were who did it, but yes. uh, what about it? Yes, it's available, and I believe we may have copies of it for sale on our website, mm -hmm. um, the Historical Society of Harvard County. Our website is harfordhistory.org. Mm -hmm. um, I know we have copies of, I believe, of the Martinet map, which was in the 1800s, but I think we also have copies of the earlier map. For sale on our website. In general, uh, for Harford County and beyond, a really good source for maps is the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. So you go to loc.gov, uh, select maps, and type in the county or if you know the publisher of the map, and you can get very high resolution scanned images that you can download to your computer from that site. Uh, they don't have everything. There's probably some stuff that uh, Historical Society has that Library of Congress doesn't have. There may be stuff Library of Cong Congress has that the Historical Society doesn't have. And that's just one. There are other sites out there. It's just my go-to site because I work all over the state. Um, we have another suggestion. Um, have we looked at any of the, or have you had a chance to look at any of the early newspapers? Apparently, the Maryland Gazette has numerous stories about the people and happenings in Joppa. I've done some initial collecting of data from that. Um, I use newspapers.com. I think you might have access uh, for free through the public library, I'm not sure. Uh, but yes, uh, archived newspapers are a great source. And there's all kinds of stuff in there. I just haven't had time to collect it all or process it all, but I have started. And that's the kind of thing that would you know, be very helpful to have volunteers who could just systematically and do what um, historical researchers refer to as stripping the records. That is basically going through them and recording everything that has anything to do with Harford County and more specifically Joppa. And as we get names from doing land title search and other sources, we can then search those newspapers for those names too. So we'll have to go back to them constantly. But uh, yeah, newspapers are a great source. The Maryland Gazette from 1727 maybe is available. And also there's some European newspapers and, and magazines that make reference to events in the colonies, including this area. So uh, there's, we could cast a very big net. So if anyone's interested in actually helping to volunteer on this project, if you could contact the Historical Society of Harford County, 
Again, you can use our website. <clears throat> um, you can email us through the website. Uh, I think it's info at harfordhistory.org. Um, if you're interested in becoming involved in this project, let us know and we'll get you in touch uh, with Jim and Adam and the folks who are involved in this project because volunteers are how history gets research, local history gets research. I might add for those of you who are of a certain age or you know, you're in high school, you're in college, uh, this is a great source of material for high school students to compete in history fair and doing well to help you get into the college of your choice. For college students, material for term papers, uh, you know, certainly for graduate students, there's a lot of possibilities here for career development. And so for those of you who have kids or grandkids, you know, you may want to pass this idea on to them. Uh, it really does is a great opportunity. And since the Smithsonian is a partner in this, you know, you're also working with the Smithsonian Institution. And frankly, that does not look bad on a resume or college application. So, Well, this has all been very helpful. I want to remind folks, if you would like to volunteer to help on this effort, please contact the Historical Society. Uh, we will get you in touch uh, with the team there. And um, when we're able to open up our building, as we finish our construction projects, uh, you'll be able to come in here and use um, some of our resources, which in some cases are very local resources. We have diaries, for instance, mm. from folks who were local who have provided those to us that they're not going to be available anywhere else. Mm. Um, we have um, also access to a number of the research, uh, the, the virtual research right. resources. And we have folks here who can help you figure out how to do that research. Mm. Yeah, we don't want we don't want the plague to get in the way of all this. There's still a lot that can be done online, especially title search through the Maryland State Archives. And we can help you set you up, teach you what you need to do, and, and hopefully organize efforts so we don't have a lot of duplication. So are you planning to do another day in this, this coming summer? Uh, Adam and I haven't talked about it. I think the, the uh, assumption is that we would. Uh, but let me also say that we're not confined to working in the summer. That's when he has university field schools uh, give with property owner permission, you know, starting out with the church. There's no reason we can't be out there, you know, next month. Um, so, you know, we could do this year round. And frankly, summer is the worst time of the year to be doing it in, in, around here. It's just too damn hot, humid. But now is a beautiful time of the year to be doing archaeology in the spring, too, in between rains. So we're not confined to doing this project to July and August. Um, based on the work that you've done, you talk, we talked a little bit about the work you've done in Southern Maryland. Um, what have you learned already about daily life in colonial Maryland or in colonial Tidewater, Maryland? Well, I've learned so much that my head is bursting with it. But um, one of my, one of the most profound findings I've found, and it doesn't apply just to the colonial period, but it starts in the colonial period, is that humans have transformed the landscape around us incredibly. And we don't appreciate that now. You know, you look out, you see trees, you see roads and everything. Everything looks very static. But the environment we see today is not the environment that was here 200 years ago. And I don't just mean all the houses and businesses and streets. Uh, we've transformed the, the surface of the earth. Uh, huge amounts of soil have departed <laughs> and found their way into waterways and into the bay. Uh, the trees, the forests we see today are nothing like they were 200, 250 years ago. The, the, the animal plant communities are very, very different. And the thing is they're continuing to change in our lifetimes. And we don't see it because it, relative to the scale of our lives, it happens very slowly. But the, the changes are just profound. And I think if that's one of the important things I've learned from doing archeology span in Maryland over the past 30 years, and every time we, almost every time we stick a hole in the ground, we're seeing that profound effect on the landscape. And it's not all agriculture. Sometimes just using your front yard can cause a significant amount of erosion. And the plants you decide to plant or the plants you decide not to plant. The animals you have around your, your yard, your household cat gets out and kills birds. 
how that, that affects local population dynamics. So. Well, I think we have pretty well uh, run out of question. Oh, wait, no, we just got a new question. Go ahead, you can read that font. It's awfully small. <laughs> what books or reading would you recommend on your type of work and the material culture of the Upper Chesapeake? Material culture, hmm, somebody using a big term there. <laughs> material culture is a word we, a uh, phrase we use to really refer to all the artifacts that people create, including our language and song and poetry and everything else, buildings. Uh, one of the best basic texts on archeology span of the historic era was by a fellow who actually was a native Marylander. He was also one of the grandfathers of modern archeology, span and that is a book by James Dietz. And it's called In Small Things Forgotten. It's about 90 pages long. It is truly a pocket book. You can put it in your hip pocket. It is well written. It deals with the whys of archaeology. Why do we do this? What do we expect to learn from it? It really focuses on the colonial period, uh, the Eastern United States, not Maryland specifically. Actually, I think he was born and raised in Cumberland. Um, but it's very readable. Um, it's a classic textbook we use in colleges. And I think it's a very enjoyable read. For artifacts of the colonial period, again, the classic is by a fellow named Ivor Noel Hume. He was actually a Brit uh, and came to the United States and was the chief archeologist down uh, uh, Williamsburg for many years. Uh, his book is called uh, Artifacts of Colonial America. You can buy it online probably for about 15 bucks. Uh, Dietz's book, you could probably get for a buck. It's just a little paperback. These are two foundational texts, and we've learned a lot since those books were published. And Small Things Forgotten was published in 1977. Noel Hume's book was published in 68, I think, 69. And we've learned a lot, but still, the foundational books, and you know, we've just built on them. So I encourage you to find those books and, and read them. They're both inexpensive, and both should be readily available online. Okay, well, I think that just about wraps us up for this afternoon. Um, I do want to share with our viewers um, a couple of parting thoughts. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, the Historical Society has for many, many years published uh, regular historical bulletins. We don't have a number of bulletins that cover the Joppa area. So we are interested in inviting other folks uh, to come do some of the research that, that Jim has talked about today. Hint, hint. <laughs> hint, hint. And, and then help us publish it, you know, in a manner and a form that it will be available 100 or 150 years from now. Um, <clears throat> we um, hope that if you've enjoyed this presentation, you'll consider making a donation and becoming a member of the Historical Society. You can do that by visiting our website, which is www.harfordhistory.org. Our next virtual event is on Tuesday, November the 9th at 12.30 p.m. It will be the story of the Deer Creek Choir. Um, and I think we even have a virtual performance as part of that. Uh, more importantly to us, to us at the Historical Society, um, or as importantly, um, next weekend on October the 23rd, we will have a book sale of numerous books of all sorts and types. Some of them are history books, some of them are novels, some of them are children's books, some of them are gardening books. There's a wide art books, there's a wide array of, array of materials. Uh, we will have them for sale from nine to three here at our headquarters building, 143 North Main Street in Bel Air. Uh, the, the, the sale will be conducted outside. Uh, so we are all uh, talking to the rain gods about keeping it far, far away. It'll be outside. We won't try to have people come trooping through our construction site. That would be scary. Um, but we would very much like to invite you uh, to join us on Saturday, October the 23rd at the book sale. Um, then we will also have another performance in December, a virtual performance by the Dan, Dan Meyer Choir, uh, who will be doing Christmas and um, Maryland uh, related songs for us. <clears throat> um, so 
I did promise to talk a little bit more about what's behind us before we're done. Um, this is a copy of the Bush Declaration. It was signed on March 22nd, 1775 by a group of Harford County residents who gathered at the Bush uh, Tavern, uh, which is in Abingdon. It, the building itself still stands today. If you go behind it, uh, you'll find um, some archeological work that was done behind the Bush Tavern. Um, when the State Highway Administration did some work. And so they have a little display there, just a panel that tells you a little bit about Bush and its role in the, in the American Revolution. Um, the ending words of this document, at the risk of our lives and fortunes, is uh, also the motto of Harford County. You'll find that on Harford County Shield. And if you look at the Declaration of Independence, you will find an homage to that phrase as well. Um, so come and visit us at the Historical Society when we open. In the meantime, visit our website, um, uh, order some of our bulletins to learn more about their, our history, and uh, join us again uh, October 23rd at the book sale, and join us virtually on November the 9th. Thank you very much, and have a great afternoon.